Hi, it's young Dan Shea, uh, young Sergeant Siler from Stargate. Richie Dean Anderson's a stunt double. I'm way more handsome than him, but uh, I don't have half the uh, money. You're listening to the MacGyver uh, podcast with Mac Jackson. Hi, I'm Richard Dean Anderson. My name's MacGyver. Colonel Jack O'Neill, SGY. My name is Pratt, Ernest Pratt. I always get a happy, tingly feeling when I see those guys. Name one contract that I failed to execute. MacGyver. Oh, here we go. You're a target. And I don't intend to miss. Over my rotting corpse. Sorry, did I say that out loud? Glowing eyes, cliche behavior, evilness, that kind of thing. Is mental illness contagious? You think? You can do anything you want to do if you put your mind... Well, you do have a penchant for pulling brilliant ideas out of your butt. Head. Out of your head, when we need them. Oh, stuff's already here, I just find a different way to use it. I like your attitude. Permission to take a team through the Stargate, sir. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of the MacGyver Podcast. I'm your host, Mac Jackson. And today I have someone who, anybody, who, well, I was going to say an unsung hero of TV and movies, etc. But he's really not unsung anymore, at least ever since Stargate. Uh, Sergeant Siler himself, Dan Shea among other many, many, many things. Exactly. How you doing? Doing all right. I'm glad to finally pin you down. Uh, I, I have the same trouble with some guys who are always working. And, they, you know, they're, I'm sorry, I can't do it right now. But you know what? If you're working, that's not a bad thing. Working's a very good thing. Right? It's a and very, very good thing. Did You had a, a nice visit with your daughter? Oh, yeah, yeah. I told you that. She just left. Uh, my daughter's, uh, now she's a... Uh, a young uh, resident doctor. She uh, went, went to med school in Cork, Ireland, graduated. They only took 52 international students back into Canada, which she, she became an international student, even though she's from Vancouver. And she was one of the 52 in the whole world uh, to make it back. So now she's uh, working in a hospital over on uh, Vancouver Island. And she was just home here for Remembrance Day for a couple of days. And she just took off for the, uh, for the ferry home. So uh, how, how far away is she? I mean, I see, I know you're in Vancouver, right? Yeah, 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 totally. So, yeah, so, Vancouver. Uh, oh, I lost you. What happened? No, no, I'm, I'm still here. I don't, I don't see you anymore. Oh, I, probably on your screen. Let me click on this here. Oops. Yeah. Usually down in the lower left, there is something for, to visually see the screen. Hmm. Isn't that weird? Have, but you know what? Something. As long as you can hear oh, me. Here we go. I oh, good. Yay. Coming back. Yeah. <laughs> There's launch meeting. No, I don't want to launch a meeting. Or maybe I should say launch meeting. Well, no, because launch meeting means you're starting a new one. Uh, all you open have... on Zoom. There we go. Oh, gotcha. okay. Good. See? Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> anywho, uh, yeah, how far away is Vancouver Island from where? Uh, it's it's uh, right off the coast of Vancouver. It's a uh, two hour ferry ride. We have lots wow. of ferries that go back and forth, and it's really cool. It's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, in the summertime, especially, you can stand out on the deck of the ferries and you can just see the beautiful uh, uh, ocean, which, you know, goes, actually it's not an ocean between the island and the mainland. What's that called? A strait? Whatever yeah, it is. yeah, it's yeah. Great. I think they it's have great strait. food on there and, and it's really a pretty nifty thing. I, I really love it. Unless, of course, you need it for work. And then it becomes a bit of a thing because sometimes with the wind, they get delayed and shut down and so on and so forth. So, oh, sure, yeah. sure. It's really well, cool. If you've been to Vancouver, get on one of the uh, ferries to Vancouver Island. I'm telling you, one of my dreams is yeah. to go to Vancouver. Because... I, I'm surprised you haven't been here with all your connections to uh, like MacGyver and Stargate and stuff. You I know. That would be a dream come true. Uh, because You know, somebody goes, if you had a choice to go anywhere in the world for a vacation, and, yeah. you know, I say Ireland and everything, but I always say Vancouver because, one, it's beautiful. Yes. Two, the food uh, is phenomenal. Yes. Uh, and three, I would spend all day or all my entire vacation going, MacGyver was shot there. 
And that's yeah. where that happened. And that's for that at Stargate's over there. And but you know, and nobody else would care. There's the uh um uh Rick Drew yeah, has, has Rick become Drew a buddy. Later, of, yeah. He's become a buddy of mine, and he posted a picture of the clock that's in downtown Vancouver that has the steam in, coming in out of it. Yeah, the, the yeah. steam clock in Gastown, yeah. He posts that and I go. I already know what that's from. They used that in the beginning credits from MacGyver. He's eating an ice cream in front of it. Oh, that's right. And then down around the corner, if you go down that hill, that building that's right there, the back of it is the dojo from Highlander, the series that Duncan owns. Okay, yeah. They always shoot it coming from the, you know, the other side up. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, there's an episode of MacGyver where they, they use that corner. Nobody else would care about this. Nobody else would notice. But I'm watching it and I'm like, oh. I know exactly where that is. And I've never been in the town. Hey, you know the, the town inside out. You haven't been there. Actually, a lot of people would recognize lots of those uh, uh, locations because they get used a lot. Oh, yeah. And MacGyver's cabin. Well, there's two MacGyver's cabins. There's the one that's on the water where they shot a lot of stargates where he would sit out. I think he would pretend to go fishing. And then yeah, there's the Jack's original cabin. MacGyver's cabin, which is up in a place called the, uh, the GVRD, which is uh, where they used to shoot... Uh, uh, X Files. We shot a ton of MacGyver's there. We shot um, MacGyver's women up there. I remember one time on a gorgeous day, they took a shot of Rick at, at uh, the mid station, looking down at him, just seeing the uh, uh, forests and the mountains and stuff. And he just said, "Welcome to Vancouver." Uh, and it was it was just so incredibly beautiful. But it's also incredibly nasty and rainy too, because uh, yeah. you know it's a, a rainforest. Yeah. Well, uh, Seattle all the way up, I know, is just. Typically, yeah. rain is more than. And where are you? Where's your hood? Where are you from? Uh, Pennsylvania. I'm. Okay. It, it's Dixon City, but it's essentially Scranton. Okay. So Good. I was born in Scranton, and then just moved 15 minutes away to you know it. It's all technically Scranton, but it's yeah. like a, a Dixon City is a borough. It doesn't even count as a real city. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I'm telling you, I I, I, I see you know i can reckon it was jack's cabin for example you're mentioning yep. jack's cabin that gets mm -hmm. used in everything there's shows yep. you know uh, my my parents would like if i see you in something i go oh there's dan shea and, and they'll look at me and they'll go macgyver i'm like it's stargate like everybody's been on macgyver I'm like well yeah you are know. you more of a macgyver guy or a stargate guy both i'm mm -hmm. i'm a i'm a richard you wouldn't remember but a few years ago at one of the um the cons back, I think it was like 2008, yeah. uh, you were on stage and, and talking. And whenever you would mention a, a, a show or a thing that you worked on, you're like, oh, there was this one. I'd be like, Eyes of the Stranger. And you're like, yes. And then you'd mention something else. I'd be calling it out. And you're like, yeah, sheesh. So like, uh, you know, Richard Dean Anderson, I adore. Yeah. Um, so anything connected to him. I'm going to see or own or, you know. Can you remember that. Where, where that convention was? Yeah, uh, New Jersey. Mary, Mary, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Very good. I was thinking about that the other day. I was thinking about all the places I've been for these conventions. And I remember uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. It seemed like an odd place. It was great. I, yeah. I wound up watching um, the first time ever. What was Miley Cyrus' show when she was a kid? Hannah Montana. And I, because I remember I left my hotel and I walked and it was kind of a, a highway and I went to a restaurant or a store and I came back and I thought, well, they're going to come and pick me up in a couple of hours. So I, I'm checking my TV and, and there was Hannah Montana and, and, and it was so strange that I was hooked. Like I couldn't, it, there, the actors were all yelling and, and uh, it, it was, it was, I couldn't tear my eyes away from it. I watched three or four uh, of those in a row and then they took me in but I, I'll never forget to Cherry Hill New Jersey because it just seems like the, uh, the a weird the, yeah you wouldn't think you'd yeah. like okay in New Jersey who wants to yeah, see yeah, me yeah, in New yeah. Jersey well I remember and this is why I couldn't wait to, to chat with you now because ever since then everybody adored you and you had a great time on stage and and everybody was like so excited but of course they they lessen your time to unless we catch you off stage, like walking around, yeah. your time on stage was limited, okay. and you were so much fun to listen to and tell your stories and you know hear all of that. I thought you know, yeah. and not to mention people like um, uh, Jackson Davies I just had on, and he's yeah, like, yeah. 
have you talked to Dan yet? I said, I'm working on it. I, everybody that I talked to, they all say, you got to talk to Dan. I said, I know you're yeah. preaching to the choir. Oh, exactly. which reminds me, Pat O'Brien says hi. Yes, I, he, uh, what did he have? He posted something the other day, oh, his mother, picture of his mother, who was, it was her birthday and she's like 95 years old or something. Huh. She looks good. Yeah, he mentioned uh, you guys would golf. Oh, that story, oh, he, oh God. We were on MacGyver over actually in Victoria shooting in this castle. And uh, he was like a, a rich kid. He golfs all the time. He brags about his golfing. He's got all the golfing clothes and the golfing bags. And he was uh, asking me one day, we're in kind of a football field. And he said, you want to have a little chipping contest to get closest to those uprights? And I'm like, I'm not a golfer. I'm a hockey player. I can't golf. And he's like, come on, what are you, chicken? Uh, what are you, you know? So I said, okay. So he gave me a club, gave me a, a nine iron, and we had a chipping contest. And I got closer than him. And I, I won. And he got really furious. He said, two to three. And I go, Pat, I'm not a golfer. I, I concede you're way better than me. Uh, just, you know, give it a break. He goes, let's do it again. So we have another chip on contest and I beat him again. And he said, you're such a cheater. <laughs> and, uh, and so th that's, you know, and then uh, I mean, we're not going to say who won, but we're, we're, we're going to say that uh, we're not going to say who lost either. But, uh, and, <laughs> and Pat keeps bringing that story up 40 years later. Or maybe it's me who keeps bringing it up 40 years later. I'm not sure. No, no it, it's him. Because when, yeah. I talk, when I talk to him, he goes... Mention the golfing story to Dan when you talk to him. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, yeah, you're yeah. asking for it. He goes, oh, out of Ryan, yeah, good boy. Right? Prop, props guy. Speaking of props guys, we're thinking of that, uh, the armorer shooting the other day, and he, uh, Pat would have been in charge of that. He would have been appalled. Of uh, Anyways, just, uh, remember Rust? Was it Rust? Um, oh, uh, yeah, 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 with the shooting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awful, awful, awful yeah. Isn't that yeah. terrible? And, you know, and, and the guy who, who, I, apparently is responsible his lawyer's going well it's not really his fault and i understand he's doing a hail mary but at this point somebody died like just yeah. accept you, it you mean the first ad yeah yeah well, the, the thing, guy what, thing is we have very stringent uh safety controls on movie sets but they were shooting apparently tin cans with live rounds at lunch ah. i think that's what i heard that so that should tell you all you need to know about there but but uh uh, number one, uh, it's the armorer who brings the weapon to set, not the first AD. Number two, when the armorer gets it to set, he or she opens it up and gets a flashlight, looks down the tube, or down, down the barrel, looks uh, uh, all through it and to everyone and to say, you know, the weapon's clear and safe. Show it to the actor, weapon's clear and safe. On the radio, weapon's clear and safe. Anyone want to come and see? He or she locks it up, gives it to the actor. Actor or stunt person has to say, my finger's off the trigger. Because you never actually pull the trigger during rehearsal. Your finger is straight off the trigger because mm -hmm. you're setting up where they're supposed to shoot. And when you figure out where they shoot, then if you're shooting your camera, you put up Lexan to protect the camera. If you have an actor off camera, put Lexan in front of her or him. Better yet, don't have the actor there at all because why are they there? They, you know, you're just shooting a, a gun. Do all your dialogue cut. Just do the shoot. Shoot the weapon and then do the dialogue again without the shooting. And uh, it was just insane. Everything went wrong. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Honest yeah. to goodness. And it's such, a, it's such a shame. And, and there's people that like the next day were making jokes about Alec Baldwin. I'm like, that's not funny. It, oh. it, somebody died. No, 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 no. You know, it, you, it's not worth the joke that they're doing. But no, um, no, you, can't, no you can't joke about that. I think speaking of such a thing, I think I saw and you worked on Arrow, correct? Yeah, yeah. Not much, but yes, I've worked on that. Yeah. There's a blooper where I guess they were shooting an arrow towards the camera, but it was supposed to be off. Oh, yeah. And when it hit right in the middle of the of the lens, and then you actually oh, see God. them go, ooh, Whoops. like, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, yeah you <laughs> but you're right. You got to be – you never know. I, yeah. was, I was amazed that there's actual real guns on a set. I never would have thought that. Well, they're, they're – they've been uh you know changed over to for blank so they start off as a real weapon but i mean they're not they're they're not actual uh well they're not supposed to be firing they they have constrictors in there i mean it's a uh yeah they're they're modified weapons that only are uh touched by the armorer end of story so right right he or she will, will know you know well the situation is. i uh what a, start off there's always questions i i wanted to ask you uh first of all it's amazing the things that you do even on your off time 
like you're doing the polar bear swim, you know, because uh, watching you and commenting through social media, I'm mm -hmm. like, he's nuts. He's doing a pull like you and a, 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 a Bill Nikolai. Yeah, cut, Vern. Vern's really he, good. I call him Vern. He, he's cut from the same cloth. Wait, during, during the COVID, they shut uh, Vancouver down originally last summer. And they made everybody sit inside, being unhealthy, eating potato chips and doing the worst possible thing for your cardiovascular system. But Vern sure. and I, we were on our bikes blasting around Vancouver, not getting close to anyone, working on our fitness level. And they shut down all the outdoor gyms, but we kept looking around for places where we could do chin-ups. So all the fitness freaks found where, they, where you could do chin-ups, like not the official chin-up bars where they had shut down, but there was like uh, metal showers for the summer. And, and so we would do, you know, modified workouts, uh, uh, we'd be blasting around on our bikes. I would uh, zoom up to a place called uh, 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 Cypress Mountain, and it was gorgeous up there. But I would see Vern. We, we'd be passing each other on our bikes, coming or going from these uh, chin-up bars. And uh, so, yeah, he's a he's a real uh, fit guy, right? Uh, and a good guy for sure. Yeah, good. Well, you know, and you were asking, oh, are you more of MacGyver or, or Stargate? And I said both. Yeah. Well, the, one of the things that they have in common is good people. Yeah, it's uh, the well, you know, people... sorry, sorry to interrupt. I just speaking of no, Bill, go speaking ahead. of MacGyver, he's the, basically he's maybe the reason I've had my career because um, I just finished the thing with David Soul. I was a stand in, had a couple stunt days. What the heck was that called? It was a sci fi thing with, uh, with Emmett Walsh. It was a candle thing. And then I got a call from a person named Sandra. Uh, uh, she was the extras uh, person on MacGyver because Bill was Rick Standen. He was actually a very good physical match for her here, but he wanted to get put on a weekly or taken off a weekly because it was one or the other. So they got rid of him and they brought me in because I had just done a hockey episode and uh, I took over for him. And then that led to me being uh, Rick's hockey buddy. We'd play hockey all over the city and and I was interested in stunts. So Vince Dedrick Jr., uh, uh, every once in the blue moon would, would throw me a day when and when Blaylock was on first unit or second unit I would come in and fill in for for him yeah. and it was because Vern bailed that I had my chance and then from there um, uh, I actually got my first official double for for Rick I think you had said the name no not stranger there's another one we shot in there's, Toronto there's eyes of a killer eyes of a stranger eyes of a killer. I think no eyes of a killer was with was Mark eyes. Mark Helgenberger, she was, and he was. Yeah, like, yeah, it was Eyes of a Killer. No, that was, was that here? Or was that Toronto? Let me think. No, that was, Eyes of a Killer was here. Uh, that Eyes was of a Stranger was, was, was with uh, Justine Bateman. And yeah, he, Eyes yeah. of a Stranger. We shot that in Toronto. We both had beards. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the first time I, I, I be, became Rick's stunt double. And I remember uh, we did this gag, like I flew all the way from Vancouver. My wife was a flight attendant. So I, our, our kids were babies back then. So I remember putting the kids to bed. We had one car, this old beater. I drove the beater to the airport. We had crew parking. I had to fly standby because we were airline people. I, you know, if I didn't get on, I wouldn't have got the gig. Flew all the way to Toronto, got in at 6 a.m., took a bus into downtown, took a cable car uh, to set uh, to, to, uh, to do this thing, jumping over a fence. And then we had another gag where uh, Rick was inside a uh, uh, factory grabbing these bags where they were sabotaged or something, a cable wrapped around his foot and pulled him towards these two big mm -hmm. rollers. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was supposed to be the stunt was to put my foot near the roller and the, the, the effects guy said, that's stupid to put a person's foot near there. We'll just get a dummy leg and put it in there. But, but we said, no, he's here. He's a stunt double. I want to do my stunt, my first official Richard Dean Anderson stunt, which was the dumbest thing to do to put your foot in these rollers. And so they, they had this uh, cable so that if I got too close, I could just pull it away as a safety. But because it was a wide shot, the safety thing kept falling out. So they said, can we actually attach your leg to the, so pulling you into the rollers? And I go, oh, okay. So they actually <laughs> pulled it in the rollers and the, the guy either, all of a sudden my foot got caught in these rollers and I'm screaming and either the guy uh, pressed reverse and it took a second to go and then spit me out sure. or he or he pressed the, the wrong button which sucked me in but anyways it, it almost crushed my foot Ooh. and it uh and it, it, it uh, spit me out and uh that was my first um stunt for rick i almost lost my leg and i remember i was university educated I, my my small town it was all factories everyone worked in factories nothing wrong working in a factory i did it when i was in high school but i couldn't stand one second of it so here i was about to lose my limb in a factory accident, making a movie, which I would have lost a limb if I would have stayed in my hometown, you know, and did it for real. 
and and then but the good news though was um uh, we were doing this other movie uh call of the wild the 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 director of the one we just talked about did the the call of the wild and then uh, he felt really bad this director that i hurt my foot and so eight months later they were uh, casting for call of the wild ricky schroeder was the star of it and it was the same director can't remember his name for the moment and i my, my foot was totally cured at that point but i went in for the audition pretending to limp for the same director and because uh, he felt so bad that it, it, he felt responsible for my <laughs> foot being almost destroyed and and uh he said get out of here you got the part so I wound up getting a part on Call of the Wild, Ricky Schroeder, just because of that accident eight months later. Isn't that funny? Well, you know, it's funny, too, because I now when I watch it, I watch that that scene. Yeah. They did such a good job that it, it looks like it's Rick all the way up to the end because he's yeah. freaking out. You know, his character's freaking out at that moment, too. Yeah. Shut yeah. it off. Shut it off. Shut it. You know, yeah. and I, every time I watch it, I'm like. Okay, where's where's Dan's foot? Let me see where where would Dan's foot have been? Yeah, and I'm right, assuming yeah. it's that last couple seconds right before it's about to go in. in. Roller, yeah, 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 yeah. Ooh, yeah. sheesh. So you never know how they cut things. I don't recall ever seeing that movie, but you never know how they wound up cutting it. Yeah, what was left in and what got punted. So. Well, I remember it was after MacGyver, and, and he was going intentionally trying to go against the type being being the hero. Yeah. So he played a lot of villains. Yeah, yeah. And Eyes of a Killer was he, with, you know, Marg Helgenberger. Uh, and he's really the killer in that one. He's got the long, yes. black, snotty hair. And, you know, and you're yeah. like, oh, you could tell right from the beginning, this guy's not a good guy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, totally. Um, well, uh, one of the things I've been dying to ask was, did you go into the business as an actor first and fall into stunt work? No pun yes. intended. You yes. did. Okay, there I, you go. Well, how I got started was, it was a fluke. that I heard uh, that there was a beer commercial. Uh, and they were auditioning down at a place called the Denman Inn, which no longer exists down on Denman Street in the west end of Vancouver. And I, I crashed the audition. I got in there. They had no control back then. There's just all these actors in there. I saw these actors. and The first human beings I've ever seen with huge eyes and big white chiclets and thick hair. And I'm thinking... Like, who are these guys? And they were actors. You know, you, if, you, if you have huge eyes, huge mouth, huge ears, and huge hair, then you were an actor. So they, they, we, I get in there, and I'm, no one knows who anyone was. And they used to take these Polaroids back then, and, you know, sure. they just zoomed up. So then I got into the audition, and when I got in there, uh, I just started joking around to, to the director and the producer. And the other actors were trying to be serious and name-dropping and how, you know, theatrical, Shakespeare, and this and that. And I was, yeah, just, yeah. Uh, I was just goofing off, and they really liked me. And then uh, like an hour later, I got this uh, part. It was a Labatt's Blue. It's a beer we have here in Canada. Sure. Shot in Hawaii, in Kauai. And so two days later, I'm on a plane to go to Hawaii in the middle of a Vancouver winter to shoot a beer commercial. And it, it, it was huge production value. They had this big balloon we're shooting. They had the frogmen in the water taking shots of us. And I remember I got out, I was watching the play and I saw this movie called Meatballs. Oh, yeah. With Bill Murray. And I remember watching it, and I thought, God, that, that actress is, is pretty hot. And uh, can you still say actress is hot? Is that, is that, hey, yeah, okay? yeah, can sure. you still say that? And so uh, when I got off the plane, I thought, God, that's, that's the girl from, from the movie. Well, that's funny. And all of a sudden, we got off the same plane, and then we got off the plane to get onto another plane to go to Kauai. So I think we'd maybe landed in Waikiki, and the same girl got off the plane, and then we got in the same shuttle. I'm thinking, this is weird. And we wound up going to the same resort in Waikiki or in, in Kauai and turns out she was to play my girlfriend in the beer commercial and for the next four days this super hot actress from this movie was sitting on my jet ski pretending to be my girlfriend and she had to pretend to like me for every take so I remember the act the I remember the director being on the boat he had the beard and he had the megaphone saying you know pretend like you're having fun so I'm in Hawaii. I'm making more money than I'd ever made. I got this incredibly attractive female who hates my guts, but has to pretend to like me at least while we're rolling. And she had to hold on to me. And then so I would give it more gas, which made her hold on to me tighter, which endeared her to me even more. <laughs> and uh, so that was my start in uh, in showbiz. It was a beer commercial in Hawaii. And it was downhill from, from then on. <laughs> yeah. Was it, was it, when did you decide to become an actor? Like, you know, because I know for oh. all of us, there's that moment where you go, 
this is not going to be easy, but I feel driven. Like I need to. No, I was never, I never thought I'd be an actor because I never knew what an actor was. An actor actually goes to acting school and acts. Sure. I just wanted to be like a guy on screen, you know, having fun and being cool. I didn't really understand any of it. And so that's why I, I never got any parts for years and years and years. I was like, you know, I didn't train to be an actor. I was training to be stunts, but uh, I, I didn't figure you, you, you'd have to because all the things I ever got were just one or two lines anyways, and I would get shot in the head. Uh, and so, uh, so I never, I was never really an actor, actor per se. I was just a, an idiot who thought he'd want to be on, on screen and had no idea how to do it. And so I, I had, you know, I was sort of sarcastic and had a certain look or non-look and every now and then I get cast for something, but no, I was never, it took, it was 10 years later before I actually realized what an actor was and what they had to do. And then it was kind of, kind of too late. Well, and, uh, how do you get into, into um, stunt work then? Like, I mean, uh, cause here's the, the thing, stunt be, work is tough. Of That's nuts. It yeah. It was, a little, it was a little bit easier in a sense that you could control your fate. For acting, casting people ruled with a with a iron fist, and uh, I, I remember I crashed another audition. It was for a hockey commercial, and I it was at a hockey rink five minutes from where I live, and uh, that was also easy to crash because we went into the dressing room and the casting people ordinarily have control, but there they didn't really. It was an ice rink, didn't know who anyone was. Again, they were taking polaroids, and when I got on the ice, when the director saw me, like I'm an ex professional, semi professional hockey player, played university. I, played over in Europe. And so I was pretty good on the ice. And so right away they wanted to cast me, but the casting agent was totally pissed off. He, he said to my agent, if that guy ever, you know, crashes another audition, he'll never work in this town again. And so my first two or three parts were from crashing auditions and all the casting agents hated me. A, I couldn't act and B, I was crashing stuff and, and getting the roles because because actors tend to be good actors, but they can't do anything. Like they Say, can you ride a horse? Oh, right. yeah, sure. Can you play hockey? Yeah, but I don't have skates. You, you like it's so, you know, so, so idiots like me, for my little bits of parts, you don't need to really to be able to act. But if you can skate and do all these little things really well, then it, it's way better than some actor who can act his little heart out, but he can't throw a baseball, he can't shoot a hockey puck, he can't do anything mm -hmm. uh, because they spent their whole life acting. And I right. spent my whole life doing stuff, but not acting. So now I can't act, but I can do stuff. <laughs> So, like, you had to obviously, uh, what, go to school to be a stunt performer? Well, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. There are acting schools. There kind of, there's a Rick Seaman driving course in L.A., which is very legitimate and very great. But I did it a different way. I, I basically became a coattail for Richard Dean. That's what they call me, coattail. Because of my, some guys can get into the movies because they're really good at martial arts. They need a martial arts guy. Sure. And so they're fighting movie, blah, blah, blah. But, but once he or she gets in... She starts making some dough and the coordinators like him or her, then they, they can start training. Maybe the next movie is a parkour cool movie, or maybe a driving movie. And, and so they, or, you know, they, they cram for a month trying to learn how to slide a car. And then, but, you know, and so that's how a lot of people do it kind of piecemeal like that. That's what I did. But my piecemeal was through hockey. So big boy, Richard Dean was my boy. Yep. And so I became his stunt double, you know, because of hockey, because he liked me. And so I had to sort of learn on the job kind of oh thing. wow because i had i had martial arts i was a, a black belt in shotokan karate first dan okay you know I, I could run and fall see a lot of it's running and falling right sure. so and, and you can say uh, you can do that but not everyone can but but the skills you sort of pick up in an ideal world a real stunt person uh has good air sense has a gymnastics background and you know is driving and sliding cars and, and motorcycle freaks and all this kind of stuff. And then once they have all these things set up, then they start to apply their trade. And, and, and then once they get hired for something and then, Oh, you can do motorcycles. Great. I'll hire you for that. Oh, you can do that. We'll hire you for that. That's the ideal world. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not always ideal. So my, mine was more or less ideal. Basically I started because I was a hockey player doubling Richard Dean. And then I sort of learned on the job. Sure. Wow. I mean, cause you know, I'm, I remember knowing you, I'm like, okay, X-Men, there's, there he is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, White House down. Oh, there he is. Oh, got shot in the yeah, face. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, you're right. Cause there's certain movies. Like, hey, there's Dan. Boom. There yeah. goes Dan. Well, my daughter uh, was an X-Men too. She was, um, uh, Scully as an eight year, no, as a six year old. The one episode where she was trying to have a baby, I was on there. Oh, X Files! You're thinking? I was talking. I was talking about X Men. You're thinking oh, X Files? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I thought you meant X Files. Sorry. Yeah. Well, yeah, I did do X Men. Uh, I thought you were saying X Files because we shot that here. But wow. and then I then I remember this episode where myself and my 
daughter, Peter Markle, who directed that hockey movie, I think Youngblood was the director. And he and I and Rick were good hockey buddies. And sure. then he uh, wound up casting my daughter, Joey. And she she played Scully as a as a six-year-old or huh. seven-year-old way back. And it was a really, very, really highly rated episode. And uh, yeah. In, That's neat. Yeah. Yeah. It was that, fun. Uh, so, okay. So you're doing these uh, stunt things and then Stargate comes along. Yes. Did... Do you get into that because of Rick? I mean, did oh yeah, Rick definitely. Because well, actually, more Richard uh, uh, Michael Greenberg, G Money. So so Michael Greenberg's nickname is G Money. Uh, Richard Dean's uh, nickname is Big Boy. Sure. And so when the, we we were all together in MacGyver, and then we did that movie of the week in Toronto. We were discussing. Uh, yep. Michael was the executive producer for that, and we kept in touch. And then when they came back, he I was one of the first guys that Michael contacted, saying, "Yeah, you know, we, we we're coming back, and then we'll." You'll, you'll be Rick's uh, double. So that was the first time where I was, well, first time on a series mm -hmm. that I became his official stunt double. And then, and then stunt coordinator also. And then it's funny too, to go back and watch, you know, because again, in our household, it's standard to watch at least once a week, a MacGyver or yeah. a Stargate, you know, yeah. so. Oh, so sort of rough. When no. you said that, uh, Rick's, uh, uh, I guess, girlfriend, mother of his child, when they were here in MacGyver, April. No, during Stargate, yep. she came over to our place. I did something and Rick was giving me a bottle of wine or something and she was dropping it off. And just by, just by chance, we were watching, it was just on TV, there was this old MacGyver that we shot in Calgary. It was, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Oh gosh, uh, who, who was the, um, oh my God, the, the, he was a young black kid now, the, then he became a- Cuba Gooding Jr. Guy. Cuba, Cuba, Cuba yep. came out of the thing and he shot the, uh, shotgun in that episode and the next one's going to be our level and we we're shooting that in calgary so that was on so i said to my two daughter here look at there you know we're just watching the macgyver episode and then i had this picture of, of rick and i up and so his 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 um uh, girlfriend came to the door and i said hey we're watching the macgyver episode and then she saw there's this i had this big picture that uh this caricature that uh, peter the stand-in did for all of us on on way back in macgyver uh really cool and she saw that up on the wall and we had these pictures just by chance of, of Rick when he, he and I were training. So she looked at all this. So here's this freaky family watching a, a rerun of MacGyver with a picture of me and MacGyver on the wall, looking through pictures of Richard Dan Anderson. She thought I was a freak. So she went to Big Boy that night and said, how well do you know these people? <laughs> like, like really well. Yeah, yeah, it turns out I didn't, I, I knew them, you know. And the, um, the episode I believe is Serenity is the one that you're referring to. Was that okay? I just remember yeah, it was that line when you say that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the one where he's a cowboy, one of the two. Yes, correct. Um, wow, isn't that funny? Yeah, it's so yeah. surreal too, because you're like, wait, there, there, and here. Yeah, yeah, and we're just not thinking anything of it, and she's kind of going, uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, I, you know, watching the the going back now, watching them a hundred times, it's great to see your character have one line here and then then the next episode so then you become i don't know if, how much you're aware you must be because you've done the conventions yeah how much siler is loved well who do i mean who knows like, <laughs> it'd be nice if, if the young man was but yeah it was it was a fun thing and i remember i didn't get the part um they uh, we, we were working that day and they said we want you to go up to audition for this thing and it was this the, all this techno uh, babble and i went up for the audition there was martin wood brad wright and uh, cooper were there and so I started doing it and I just did what I always did, like started joking around. So I, I made them all laugh. They're just laughing their asses off. And I thought, this is good. I'm going to get the part because they, they, they're laughing. But so I, well, then I went down to set and 10 minutes later, Greenberg was pissed off at me because he got me the audition. He said, what, what did you do? Like you embarrassed yourself. He, it was, I, I, I'm like, I don't know. I, I made them laugh. He said, it, it wasn't a funny part. It was a scientific part. Like, what do you, so, so he said, go back up and do it right. Like, don't be an idiot. And so I went back up and, and I did uh, auditioned again, just doing the the the, the uh, dialogue as you're supposed to, and I wound up getting it. But I almost didn't get it because I was an idiot. I just thought if you make people laugh, then that's good, but not if it's supposedly a serious role. But then it became kind of a funny role anyway. You know, I always got kicked in the head or pushed off a cliff or shot yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and it's funny because your your character has the sympathy of the audience. Like, you know, there's the, the one where, where, you know, Rick 
touches you upgrades yeah. and you touch it and you flip over. Yes. Well, I've watched that scene uh, over and over again. And first yeah. of all, flawless on your part, because I understand oh. to go up and over a banister, it's hard to go up and over without looking like you're going up and over the banister. Well, I did one of those two on a, another movie, not MacGyver, nothing to do, with, to do with Rick. It was in Vancouver. It was a prison movie. And this one guy, huge black dude, I'd worked with him a million times. And he had to come out of his cell and push me over a railing. Well, that time I went around and wound up hitting my head. And then I went down into the porta pit and I'm bleeding all over the place. And uh, so, uh, and there's another time on an episode of Psych where I played a cowboy. I was shooting at, who's Barbara Streisand's husband? Oh, he's sure. A, he's a son of a fan. No, he's- He's the father is, is yeah. Sorry? Yeah, he's yeah. the father. Yeah, his son is no country for old men, and he also yep. did a bunch of them. Thanos. Um, Marvel. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyways, for that one, I wound up uh, going over the railing and missing my pad because they were putting down pads below me, and, and, and I didn't want to be too silly and have 10,000 porta pits. And I said, yeah, if I, if I can't hit that pad, I'm an idiot. Of course, I missed <laughs> the pad. I had to go. I'm limping up the steps to do it again. So now I had to push off with my one leg instead of my my – good leg because now the good leg's been injured so, so I had to push off had to press the button for my squib shoot the gun push off with my wrong leg and go over the thing and land on the pads uh on an episode of psych so there's a lot of that going over railing stuff James uh, Brolin by the way James Brolin by the way and what's the dad's name he was no, on that Marcus is Solomon. James Brolin well oh, James is the dad he, yeah. yeah yeah gotcha uh, but yeah uh you know we love psych too so yeah. again that's another one where I'm like hey there's Dan Hey, there's Dan. You know, let's see where. Yeah, I wasn't in sight too much. Uh, that, that's the you know, one disappointment. I wish I would have been on that show more often. I was. They had more of a rule: you're a coordinator, you stay the coordinator. You know, you don't go uh -huh. on camera that much. But the good thing about Stargate was, I was coordinating. I was uh, doubling for Rick, and I was acting. If you can call what I do acting, it was great. <laughs> but Psych was, Psych was so much fun. Yeah, and we they, just did the uh, Psych three in the summertime. The, mm -hmm. uh, this is Gus. Right? Yeah. It's going to be out pretty soon, actually. I, th I thought it already had been, but maybe not. It's coming out soon, then, I suppose. They typically do them as like a holiday movie. Okay. So it's, I thought it, it was on some other strange thing that I, I'm not aware of. Peacock or something? Uh -huh. Yeah, they'll throw it on that. Pe yeah, yeah, Peacock yeah. Plus or whatever they call yes. it. It's all NBC mm -hmm. stuff. Um, yeah. But do you have... Uh, was there ever... Well, there must have been, because Stunt Guy. What was your most dangerous stunt well you know what the, the one that i did for rick the first time i doubled for him that i just described where i almost got my foot crushed mm -hmm. that was that that was my only real injury like i've been doing this crap for like 25 years and that was it, it was my first one and that was the one where i got hurt and you all it's kind of like um reservoir dogs if you're a gangster you have to have a gangster story and when you're a stunt guy, you have to have a stunt injury story. So I got sure. to tell the one. It was cool because I got to come back to the Vancouver airport on crutches. Uh, oh, yeah, I just I was just doing a movie in Toronto and I was a stunt guy and I broke my foot. And, oh, great. And then I got to go on this uh, indemnity with the union. And so I made more money not working because it was based on the stunt rate. Uh, and I wasn't going to get any work when I got back to town anyway. So be because I was injured, I got to go on this injury indemnity for like three months as an injured stunt guy and I made more dough than I doing that than I would have uh, working because I wouldn't have worked hardly at all. That, that, that change it went, went, went way, way down. Sure. Um, but um, well, yeah, I, didn't, it was kinda, I didn't know you, gotta, you actually you got hurt. One, you, sorry? I didn't know you actually got hurt on that one. Oh yeah. yeah oh yeah. It was no. Ooh, uh, they, I thought it just rushed, scared the crap me, out of you. They rushed me to the hospital, but it wasn't, it was like a broken foot or, or something or other. So. Wow. You yeah. seem to so, shake it off pretty well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that, you know, I was a youngster. Then I broke my ankle two years ago playing hockey. I wasn't even body checked. I was just skating in center ice and I cut an edge and, and snapped my ankle. So that was, uh, we were about to shoot a show called There's Someone in Your House for Netflix, which just aired at Halloween on Netflix. It was like a millennial kill, a kill fest. This guy wearing a mask. He would wear the masks of his victims and he would kill them. And uh, it was, I, I broke my ankle the night before we were supposed to shoot. So, so that day I went for a, I think a meeting for magicians. And then I went and I worked all night with a first night broken ankle on uh, there's someone in your house because I was the only guy who had prepped it. No one else knew what was going on. And as a coordinator, you don't have to perform. It would have been terrible if I would have been a performer because they, they couldn't have replaced you at the last second. That's why, I, that's why 
they have that no hockey rule. The MacGyver people, the producers, <laughs> yeah, said that said that Rick couldn't play hockey, but he always did. Of course, Greenberg he did. Was his, best, it was his best buddy and the producer, so it was a nudge, nudge, wink, wink. But if he ever would have got hurt. Oh, we would have oh, all yeah. retired, and, and then the, the show would have gone down, you know. Well, Pat O'Brien uh, sent me a picture of you guys sitting on a bench playing hockey together. Yeah. And it, recently, I don't know, I think I, if I didn't tag you in it, I'll, I'll send it to you. Okay. But um, yeah, I, I, that's all the stories I hear, you know, from Stephen Downing. He's like, you know, I love Rick, but he always almost gave me a heart attack. Because he's yeah. racing cars and it, he would do the same things you would do. Throw himself yeah. off a mountain skiing, yeah. Yeah. you know, and, and then. He's a good skier. Right. Big boys oh, are really good great. Yeah. yeah. What's his nickname for you, by the way? B- I know you, no, you call him big boy, but he calls you. Oh, hotel. It does. He call you. Okay. He doesn't really call He doesn't actually, no one actually calls you that. But that was, that was my moniker for a decade, coach. <laughs> Cause I was clinging. It was um, Rick's best buddy uh, with the original coach tell was a writer for Friends. And he played an episode, he play, played in the Western episode, he played some gunslinger, and I can't think of his name, but he started this whole coattail thing about where, because Rick on the on the uh, Cowboy episode wore this big long jacket. Mm-hmm. And this guy, the original coattail, was describing how we, we all had these huge heads and little bodies, and we were just holding onto his coattails going, wee, and all, you know, <laughs> clinging onto him. And that's where, the name Coattail came from. He was the original Coattail, but then he went on to, you know, become legitimate uh, executive producer and writer for Friends. Luke, ha, ha, oh God, I had his name there. Oh gosh, and then then I became then uh, the 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 new Coattail. coattail. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. funny. And you, tell me, and again, not to get into too much technical stuff, but what the heck? It's our conversation. What goes into like your daily work for prepping for stunts? Because like I see you do stunts. I go, oh, there he is. Ooh, okay. And I always am impressed with the fact that one, you're doing it, two, you're able to get up again and smile. Yeah. But the the prep and all that type of stuff, what goes, like you get a job and what happens? Well, there's, there's two parts. There's the stunt coordinator, which is what I do, and also performing, which is what I do. The coordinator makes things safe. Coordinator breaks down the script. They go on a text survey. How are we going to do this gag? Uh, and and either on a wire or pads or both. And then you get a stunt performer who's skilled at doing that gag and uh, whatever it is. And he or she will know what it, what it is ahead of time. And they will either do it with their eyes closed because they're so great, or they will rehearse a few times, or we will rehearse uh, ahead of time on the actual location and shoot what's called a previs, where some handy guy with a camera will shoot the thing. Um, shoot the nice angles so for the director so they you know uh, sometimes the directors uh, aren't aren't that keen or or that spectacular at action so now you let the action people do it and so then you once you've rehearsed and you're dialed in then on the day you 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 go and do it and and uh, you combination of the coordinator making it safe and the performer being really skilled and making it safe for some of these guys it's like a walk in the park to do some of these gags like they're so skilled uh, but anything can go wrong. So you got to be sure. careful and you have to make it safe. And even though it is safe, you still should have pads and s- stuff standing by in case a cable breaks or something or other. Yeah. Yeah. It can always happen. Well, like the one where you get pushed over the stairwell, I'm always trying to think of what it looked like for you, what you landed on, because that's a yeah. stairwell. That doesn't I, go I, away. I, I, I jumped, I fell on pads with Brad Kelly and uh, Sean Stewart were two Jaffa. And they were holding what's called a porta pit. I wasn't that far down, maybe seven feet down. Martin Wood, the director, actually wanted me to do the flip and land on the metal stairs. And I'm like, what, what are you nuts? You think I'm a real stunt man? I'm not going to do that. And so they yeah, did it I could do it once. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we changed it so that me leaving the shot, falling onto a pad, and then have an empty frame of the steps. And I would launch myself into the steps and do, do a little bit of a roll. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. Because I'm always thinking about because it's at an angle, the steps, if you had to actually build a stand to put the padding on to land on. If we, if we were doing a huge feature and we were doing it properly and we had time, we would do that. But episodic, you're rolling along. So basically I had two huge monsters. Holding you know, six, it? Two, yeah, basically holding it. They're not holding it. There was, it was propped on something because the stairs are quite narrow. The stairs went here, here, and here. So they were able to 
prop the porta pit on the stairs, but they were basically holding it. And yeah. uh, if if I would have missed it, of course, then I would have, you know, dropped a couple of floors, which wouldn't have been great. But I wasn't falling that far. And the porta pit's pretty big. Yeah, yeah. So again, yeah. I would have been an idiot if I would have missed it, but I did miss it on psych. <laughs> and luckily, I missed it on psych because it was just dirt. If I if I would have missed it on Stargate, it would have been yeah, like crippling. Death. Yeah. Well, did uh, did Don Davis ever tell you the story of how he got into acting? Uh, I'm sure he must have. Well, he told me the stunt story when he, he was actually on MacGyver, mm -hmm. where he became oh, what's his name? Dana uh, Dana Elkar. Dana Elkar's yeah. stunt double. So he he want he he did this the stunt days for him, and then he got the check. He thought, holy crap, there's a lot of money. And he wound up buying his wife, I think, a, a dishwasher and dryer from his first paycheck as a stunt guy. He made so much dough. Yeah. And that reminds me, too, of Steve Blaylock. He was Richard D's Anderson stunt double on MacGyver. After sure. his first week of MacGyver, five days, like 14-hour days, and he got his check. And it was, he was a, a relative newcomer, too, when he got hired to double Rick by uh, Vince Dedrick, Jr., and he thought it was like one decimal point off. Like he thought maybe should I bring this back? Like this, you know, he, he didn't, but uh, uh, yeah. So you make good dough when, when it's like 14, 15 hour days. Oh yeah. But, but you don't, you, you know, it's only the top of the top shelf guys that work all the time. Uh, you know, that's why I like to be a coordinator because it's like a real job where you, you're sure. on a show and you're doing budgets and you're doing script breakdowns, you're doing tech surveys, you're doing production meetings, and then you're going to set. It's like having a real job, but the actual, performers are hired guns they have to wait for the phone to vibrate you know even if there's 10 shows or 20 shows and each each two weeks there's a new episode now on that episode there has to be someone who needs to kind of look like you and have be in your skill sets you don't always work unless you're incredibly good or if you're in uh, tight 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 friends with a coordinator who just loves you you know so uh it, it's it's not easy getting work. When you do work, it's cool. Get, I, I've always found that getting the work is harder than doing the gag. Like once oh, you get yeah. Hurt, it's yeah. easy. You know, I, I'd rather fall down and, and get hurt. If I get hurt, then I get paid for the next three months, you know? So, <laughs> but uh, it's the getting the work. That's the hard part. Well, Cl I had Cliff Simon on uh, right before he passed away. Ooh, okay. And we, we were talking about how, you know, he's known as Ball and everybody yeah. loves him. Yeah. But you're still an actor. You still need work once that show's over and you're not needed. Oh yeah, you're back to square one. Absolutely, it, it's not an easy uh, life to be an actor, which is yeah. why you know for you to act and do stunts. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, the more things see, there's this new category called stunt actor, where it's a contract and a half. Where uh, uh, ordinarily uh, you would have to have a actor and then have a wide shot and then of the double doing the thing and then then cut to the actor kind of coming up in the frame and sure. doing this because he's got a little bit of blood in his lip because he got punched. If you have a stunt actor, then the actor can give you, uh, uh, or the stunt-ish actor uh, can give you a minimal performance, you know, not Academy Award winning, but enough for episodic, enough for two lines. And then they, they can do the stunt. So it, the, the director doesn't have to compromise his or her shot. They can, you have to, you can be in tight seeing the actual person doing the actual gag. Like yeah. even like even like a ratchet or hand pull, you could like I did a lot of those where you could be close to me, I could do some dialogue, and then they can slam you into a wall, you know. Yeah. So, uh, but you yeah. can't do that with an actor. You you would have to cut somewhere, cut cut too awkwardly, cut to the stunt guy flying through the air and then hitting the ground, and then cut to a tight shot of the actor looking up. Uh, whereas with stunt actor, uh, the 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 stunt actor guy does both. And sure. so instead of having paying an actor on a contract and a stunt guy on a contract to double them, it's a contract and a half. So it saves production half a contract and, and it saves the director from these weird wide angle cuts to something tight. You, you can actually just roll on the, on the real person doing the acting and the stunt. Well, I'm thinking of you in the scene from uh, Heroes where oh, you're, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. testing the flak jacket with that new insert and... Yeah. Teal blasts you, and you had yeah. you know you're you're you, and you're saying your line, and then they go wham, and they slam you against the wall because yeah. of the blast. Yeah, yeah. And I'm yeah. like, oh, that was that was a smart thing to do, instead yeah, of having anybody cool. else let Siler be the the of guy. It was cool because they had a little little burn thing too. They had a little um, uh, the, the Jaffa hits uh, in the beginning. The, the effects guy uh, uh, would uh, uh, put these naphtaline hits which were really hot, you know, would come up under your chin. I remember Brad Kelly 
who went on to become the, the most hardest working and get the most days as a, a stunt jaffa on Stargate ever. And as we're all standing there re ready for these hits to go on, I think it was just before Tilk changed his mind and said, you're the first, a lot of people have claimed to be able to fight these guys, but you're the first person I've Oh believed. yeah, right and the then pilot. Shooting Jaffa. Well, that was Brad Kelly and me. And Brad's saying, though, so Dad, how will I know when to fall over? And I said, you'll know. <coughs> and it literally would singe your neck. So we would put the stunt retardant gel on the person's neck because it was so hot. And then uh, they, they changed this to uh, just uh, paper, uh, which was flash cotton, which was bright, but not hot. So they, huh. they so then it became a, an easier thing to do rather than burning the crap out of our necks. You're right, because and, I remember, especially in the early seasons, there's fire, right? You know, yeah. in the yeah. chest where that hit, yeah. it still yeah. has flame. Yeah. So I thought, ooh, that can't be easy. Besides yeah, was, the explosion, the heat it's alone. It was pretty warm, yeah. The, but it was, it was pretty spectacular, but it was, it was kind of unnecessary. And then as the years went by, uh, Ray Douglas switched over to uh, flash cotton. So it looked cool, but it was way safer. Yeah. Did you, um, <laughs> this is, I, I saw the, um, I saw your one of the scenes deep cover on MacGyver where you're the van driver. Oh and yeah, yeah. It, it reminded me. Did you have to have Rick's ha hairstyle during the stand-ins? Oh yeah, yes, yes, yeah. I yeah. thought so because in yeah, that he, one you you have the full yeah. mane of hair. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, he's got to be doing stand-in work at that point too. Yeah, I was a stand-in, but also Vince would throw me uh, the odd stunt day then. And uh, Bill Garrity, Mr. Garrity, was the DP, director yeah. of photography. He's a great guy. And he and he and uh, uh, Pat uh, would golf all the time. They're great golfers. And uh, but yeah, for him, you you have to have as much as you can this the skin tone and the 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 hair and everything. I remember Jan Newman who was makeup. Where was she here? No makeup. And she didn't like the color of my skin. She said, "You're so ruddy. Your skin's ruddy." I thought ruddy was cool because you're like a rugged guy. But no, she she actually meant like Irish red uh. because it, it it didn't look good on camera. And uh, and so, uh, yeah, you have to look as when you're doubling the person when you're on camera. Obviously, you have to look as much like them as possible, sure. even when you're standing. And it's a good idea. And speaking of hair, I remember I didn't want to put on this wig because it always looked like the stupid MacGyver wig. And I I can't remember my I was growing my hair each season so that I could be Rick's double and not have to put on this wig. And then I remember we're shooting a episode in a, in the Okanagan, which is grape country. And it was a great episode. Another one. Um, Sorry? I know the one. It's six yeah, seasons. Yeah, yeah. And, and finally, my hair was as long as Rick's because they gave Rick a haircut because his hair was getting too long. And uh, I remember the hair girl, uh, it wasn't Michael, who was the head of the department. It was his assistant. And she wet my hair and she was just going to trim it. And I, I'm saying, be careful now because my hair scrunches up. So it's the perfect length now. I mean, don't cut it too much because it'll, sure enough, she cut it when, it when it dried, it shrunk up. So now my hair is too short again. And then I had to go back to making those little knots uh -huh. and I'm putting a wig on. Uh -huh. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I, I grew my hair for one and a half years. Mm -hmm. And in, in 15 minutes, she just destroyed, you know, I'm back to the wig for another eight months. <laughs> well, I'm, it, it's funny too, because we always talk about how, you know, each season you could tell uh, what episode or what season of MacGyver it is by his hairstyle. And right. by the fifth season, it's so long and snotty that it's hanging off his shoulders and cur like you said, curling up. Yeah, yeah and, yeah. and I think even he has an ad lib in, in that episode of Serenity where he's arguing with Pete in the beginning. And he says, you know, I need to sleep. I need to eat. And I need a haircut. And I think the whole right. audience went, yes. So yeah, 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 I, yeah. I always think about you or anybody who else was standing in. If you didn't use a wig, you would have to mirror his style. And yes. the longer he got it, the more you probably went, stop it. Just stop. I, I'm thinking Dan must have been thrilled when Stargate started and he had the really short haircut. Well, that was a weird thing, too, because I became Siler, but I was also Rick stunt double. So there's one episode. The first episode where I was Siler was in the uh, gate room. And I was doing a scene with uh, Mr. Davis. And I remember the producers thinking that my hair and me look too much like Rick. And so that's where they came up with the greasy brill cream hair and the glasses because they wanted me not to look like them. Oh. And so I'd be, I, I, I much preferred the other look where it's just normal uh, as opposed to the, the brill cream and the glasses. Yeah. And, but, uh, uh, you know, because my, you know, it was too close to his look. And, and then they would say, well, now you, then they would say, well, you don't look like him at all. Well, you shouldn't be his double or, you know, so oh, it was, it was, but, but, the, but that's, that's what happened there. Um, 
the 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 uh, slick back greasy hair and in the glasses came be, be, because supposedly it looked too much like him too much like him. well and it's funny too because you're right because then they got rid of the the brill stuff but yeah. they kept the glasses and yeah, yeah. you know without knowing that you're his stand-in people wouldn't think that i mean you guys move oh. differently oh, yeah, you know yeah, and if yeah. and unless you're someone like me who who knows you'd go yeah. oh, okay so they hired siler to be siler like yeah. no he you know that was part and parcel with the whole stunt thing and the hair thing reminds me of i did this movie called paycheck with ben affleck i was sure. a security guard uh at near the end of the movie when he was looking for that little uh, uh, a computer chip or something or other, and all the all the um, security guards were chasing him around. Stuff was blowing up, so I was working on. One day, I had I was booked on camera for paycheck as security guard guy, and I was also on camera for Sergeant Siler across the street at the bridge. So I was at Vancouver Film Studio for paycheck, and I was at the bridge for Siler. Now, you, people have double booked themselves before, but as stunt coordinators, where they don't have to be on camera, so if they can't make it. They have a backup to cover them and they know what's exactly what's going on. But you can't get anyone to cover for you when you're on camera. So I remember I, I, I couldn't turn it down. I did I did couldn't turn down the Siler thing because I thought the producers would say, okay, if you don't want it, then we'll, you know, we won't cast you anymore. So I remember I took the, the both days crapping my pants. I showed up at the Vancouver Film Studios uh, and they did my hair. And the day before my hat had fallen off and the hair girl was mad at me. So she combed my hair and, and they, they were combing my hair on this side. And Sergeant Sider was on the other side. So she combed it and she put all this, she, she sprayed all the stuff and, and she jammed the hat on so the hair wouldn't be messed around. So I went to Dan through AD after I'd gone through the works and said, do you think you're going to be needing me for the next six hours or so? And he goes, no, nah, nah, even though we're not even going to get you. So I ran across the street uh, from the Vancouver Film Studios to the bridge. And I went into my room and I took off the uh, security guard outfit from Paycheck and I put on my Siler, which is another security guard outfit, which was a blue one. Yep. I went into hair and Patrick Hare looked at my hair and thought, what is your hair doing on that side? Why do you have all that crap on your hair? So he had to give me a, uh, a wash and he's combing it over to the other side and he sprays it. So it doesn't, so he's thinking so it doesn't go back to the other side. So now they come in and Siler is all set to do his one line. And I'm just praying ordinarily I would pray that they would hold me till later on so I would get overtime because sure. my part was inconsequential. They would shoot the, the principal guys and hold the reverse later. But this day I was praying that they would shoot my reverse so I could get the hell out of there and get back the paycheck. And thankfully they did. They turned around, they went to do my close up, And then all of a sudden I, I got a ring on my phone and they said, oh, this is Dan. I'm going, oh my God. But it wasn't Dan the AD, it was Dan's stunt person just asking me that saying that he was available for work. And I'm like, oh, thank God. So I hung up on that. So they shot my thing. I went back to the room, took off my one security guard, outfit, put on the other and ran across to uh, uh, Vancouver Film Studios where Paycheck was. And they were just breaking for lunch and everyone was nodding off because they were doing pa passwords and they hadn't shot anything because on feature films, it takes forever to shoot. Right. Episodic, they're shooting all the time, you know. And I got there and the hair person looked, looked at my hair and she said, what the hell is your hair doing on that side? She said, get back in the room. So she brought me back into the pretty department. She got this old brush, steel brush, and she just combed it back as hard as she could to make it as painful as possible. Then she sprayed even more stuff on there so my hair wouldn't go. And, and then, then we went to lunch. So. Sheesh, it's amazing your hair didn't fall out with all of that. Yes, yes. God. Yes, yes. Um, so I'm, I, I, I know you, you, you're going to have to go, but... Yeah, I got uh, a hockey game. Actually, it took so long for us to get started. I'm such a technical idiot. My, my daughter was here, and we dropped her off. And then I, I, I was waiting for the link. I thought, what the hell is going on? And then I saw something on my phone. And then it, it took me like, then I realized you contacted me 20 minutes ago. And I go, oh, my God. And then we started <laughs> the process. And so, yeah. sorry, I was a bit late. But, yeah, I got I to work where it's a show, this um, hockey team called Bright Lights. This has all these hockey stunt people. Paul Wu, who's a stunt guy. Scott Atia was the original Stargate stunt coordinator. Really? And uh, all these producers and, and stuff. So we were playing. We haven't won a single game all year because we're all like 85 years old. We're playing guys in their 30s, but it's still <laughs> fun to get beat. Yeah, well, you know, as long as you're happy and enjoying it. And you're sure. and like I said, you're constantly working, which is wonderful, especially oh. during the pandemic time. Like, Well, that no no one worked last year for six months. It was awful. They shut down the industry. But now it's, it's, it's come roaring, roaring back. I did a nice show called Lou. 
in the summer for Netflix. And that's going to be pretty cool. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So. Well, I'll probably bug you down the road if you're up for it for another chat sometime, you know. Yeah, whenever you want. I love this. Yeah. I mean, you know, because I, I re like I said, I remember you from meeting you back in 2008. And yeah. I know you're busy, but I just enjoy your story so very much. Yeah, that's um, fun to you. It, thank you. I appreciate that. Are you ready for more Stargate if and when when it comes back? Oh, I, I mean, uh, sure. I mean, I just like to work, period, if it was Stargate, sure. But I... I mean, I have no idea if it's ever going to come back. It was funny. Oh. My next, my next door neighbor walks walks his dog, and I've been I give his dog treats. Turns out he was on Stargate Universe. Uh, really? And we we were talking about all these people, Martin Wood and John Lennick, and all these actors and stuff. And I, I've been giving his dog treats for like five years, and we never really. I knew he was an actor, but it turns out we we know all the same people. And he, who was the guy that I doubled for on Legends, uh, the Canadian actor, Gray. Did you ever watch Legends? uh you mean rick's show legend no or... the, the warner brothers um oh the, sure yeah yeah the superhero one legends yes. of, yeah the dc show yeah, yeah of course yeah. of course he tell me the, the guy. guy he was a scientist what the heck's his name My ray palmer who? oh you're talking about the the um he, Older he fella. was half of firestorm yeah 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 yes yeah i know exactly you who you're talking about guy. How can I, not uh, uh, I know he was on yeah. alias he was on. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly. What you're years ago, about. he was a Canadian guy, lives in New York. But anyways, turns out my next door neighbor and he were were working together on this new um, lawyer TV series. That I think Andy McKitty was producing. Uh, Andy McKitty, who, who directs and stuff, and so that's how we got started about talking about showbiz. And then turns out we've we've known all the same folks. Ivan Bartak was Richard Dean and Michael Greenberg's uh, assistant for years, and they're yeah. best buddies. And uh, so it was it was kind of cool. Victor Garber. That's who we're yeah, thinking yeah, yeah, Victor yeah, Garber. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, such yeah. a name that you think it's fake, but no, that's his name, Victor Garber. Yeah, yeah, Victor, good, good boy, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, isn't that funny? Small world. Yes. And do you ever watch yourself on the episodes? Well, I, I mean, I, I never know when stuff is, because technically sure. I'd rather not watch anything, because hopefully I'm working and we work long hours and we don't have a chance to watch anything, and I just tend to watch sports. That's right. my thing. And then sure. I watch Rachel Maddow. That's, those are my only, she's my idol. Oh, it was <laughs> funny too, because we were, we were on this uh, uh, kind of a hockey uh, uh, texting thread with myself, Richard Dean Anderson, Michael Greenberg, and his uh, brother, Ross Greenberg, who used to be president of HBO Sports, which he gave me the, the greatest gift next to the, the, the birth of my children. Sure. And that was comped ringside seats in Vegas for almost any fight we wanted for 20 years. Because he had he had the comp tickets and he, he Michael and he were brothers, and we loved boxing. So we would go down there. The two brothers got to see each other again. I got to be ringside. We got the HBO credentials. I got to hang with all the HBO people who would who would come into the uh, Wolfgang Pucks for the pre and, and post HBO bash. And I remember watching the show. Uh, oh, what was it? Uh, the 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 uh, uh, prison movie millions of years ago on HBO. It was my favorite show. And all those. Oz? Oz. All the Oz cast are always there. And then I remember there's another one, Desperate Housewives. My daughter loved a couple of guys. So the Desperate Housewives guys were there. And I remember uh, talking, my, my daughter was back here in Vancouver. She's in Tel Aviv now. But, but, but I put her on the phone with two or three of the stars. One was Terry Hatcher. Sure. Because uh, we knew Terry from MacGyver. MacGyver, yeah. My, they got to talk to my daughter. And then I remember um, Snoop Dogg uh, was, was at one of the fights. And everyone, everyone loves him. No, not Snoop Dogg. Who's the other one that changes his name all the time from New York? Uh, yes. He's a, huh? I know, yeah, I know. Uh, oh, every, he has a different name. Uh, oh, my gosh. Uh, for some reason, I thought he was Snoop. So, anyways, this guy, you'll, you'll, you're looking up. You'll get it. Who is it? I, 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 was, I was trying to remember it on my own without looking it up. Oh, my God. He's got, how can he's got, he always has a different name. P. Diddy. P. Diddy. Yeah, so P. Diddy. So, I knew. I, all so on my own. I, yeah, so I knew PDD was coming in. So I'm sitting watching the prelims, but I kept looking on my shoulder. I wasn't even concerned about the prelims because I wanted to get P. Diddy's autograph for my daughter. And I kept waiting, waiting, and there he was, P. Diddy. So I had my HBO, HBO credentials on, and I was ringside. So they knew I wasn't a freak. Like, sure, you know, sure. I think a lot of the rappers, if you come up to them and say, I want your autograph, they, they you know, shoot you. I'm exaggerating, sorry. <laughs> Poor taste. But I, I waited to the right moment and said, you know, uh, 
and I, I knew his name, Sean, Col Mr. Sean Combs. Combs yep. uh, my daughter's a huge fan of yours. I wonder if I could get your autograph. So it was in front of like 40 people, right ringside. So it was hard for him to turn, turn me down. So I got his autograph. So I got P. Diddy's autograph for my daughter. And I was like a hero for like a week. And that happened also with Ross Greenberg. I think, I think it was his daughter's birthday or something. I think P. Diddy was there. And he said, honey, I'm going to fly back and see you for your birthday. She said, no, stay and hang with P. Diddy and tell me what, what's happening. Or maybe it was Snoop Dogg was there, there also. So it was, it was stuff like that was going on. So, uh, oh, so anyway, so we're on this, uh, we're on this uh, thread, sports thread. And we always uh, text back and forth about the hockey games. And then, so it was the playoffs, St. Louis Blues won about three seasons ago. And I said to the boys, they don't tell me anything about the game. I'm going to PVR the game. I wasn't actually going to PVR the game because I had no idea what PVR is. I was trying to be cool. I have no idea technically how to do it <laughs> because I said I'm going to be watching Rachel today. We just have to say Rachel. We know she's a one-name person, but we right. mean Rachel Maddow. And so, and so then Rick said, she, she's his hero. Richard Dean said, I'm doing the same thing. I'm not watching the game. I'm watching Rachel. And all four guys, myself, Richie Dean Anderson, Michael Greenberg, and Ross Greenberg, all athletic hockey nuts, yeah. men, older men, are blowing off the NHL playoffs to watch Rachel Maddow do one of her rants. And it was hilarious that, that all three, all four of us were not watching the, the hockey playoffs, which is our religion. Sure. Like, hockey's my religion, boxing's my vice. Yeah, yeah. And to watch Rachel Maddow. So uh, anyways. I, uh, yeah, I, I'm supposed to have Michael and Rick on. Rick said he'd do it. It's just a matter of like pinning him down to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because he's, believe he's still going off on his own adventures and, you know, nobody yeah. hears from him for a week yeah. or a month. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I'll, I'll have to bring Rachel Maddow out because I know him. We, yeah. I've met him a couple times and yeah. music is my, I'm a singer songwriter. So yeah, yeah. I know, I try and know who he likes and like listen because yeah. he's he got good he taste. Rachel. He yeah. And what do you still do martial arts? Me? Not much, no. I'm a I'm a American Kempo guy myself. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. But, I'm a Shotokan uh, guy. I used to be. Yeah, I I have to look that style up. That's a uh, Chinese? Uh martial it's Japanese. Ich ni sun shi go ruk si chat ju. What is that? That's Japanese, right? Japanese, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's not it's not good for for movie fighting because it's straight in. Uh, 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 uh rigid uh stuff. But it's yeah. good for for the streets. And you know? Kempo Kempo is so quick they can't yeah. film it because yeah. it's not wide like Chinese is this, yeah. which yeah, is yeah, great yeah. for camera. But with American yeah. Kempo, you're going bop bop bop, and I hit the guy 15 times, but the camera couldn't catch it. Exactly. You know. Exactly. But anyway, let me let you go because you have a game to get to. Going to the uh, game. Well, thanks, Mac. You're welcome, buddy. I appreciate yeah. this so much. And yeah, we'll definitely do this again. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. We'll see you, you later. You have a good night. Bye. -bye. You too. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye. The MacGyver Podcast is part of the Forever Adventure Network. Some original artwork by Joseph Arnold. Donations can be made at Patreon to Mac Jackson. Look for our group pages on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at MacGyver Podcast. Please subscribe, rate, and review. And remember... Stay creative, everyone. The Forever Adventure Network. Welcome to the adventure. Hi, this is Amara from the Always Podcast. I want to make sure you know about another awesome show, the MacGyver SG-1 Audio Series. His eyes darted over to Jack's weapon. Sam. Start taking all the gunpowder out of these bullets. He stunned Jack by taking the gun from his hands and with one swift motion released the clip and discharging the bullets in the chamber before handing the empty gun back to the general. It's written, edited, and performed by Mac Jackson of the MacGyver podcast. He's bringing together the worlds of MacGyver and Stargate to bring us all new and ongoing adventures. For some reason, something caused both Jack and MacGyver to glance up at the second floor office window that hung over the large storage hangar. It was a shadow. Of a moving figure. A figure who now was staring down at them. Before they could say anything or move, the man ran over to the railing and opened fire on them. In that moment, they each knew they were about to be riddled with bullets. Get into the epic story and hear how brothers Mac and Jack work together. Suddenly, he spun on his heels to his brother. Jack, 
Give me your phone. The general quickly took it from his pocket and handed it over. Yeah, it isn't working, you know. No, not as a phone. With that, MacGyver knelt down and smashed Jack's cell phone off the ground and cracked it open. As he pried it apart and reached for his knife, Jack stood stunned. That's... my phone. And how they disagree. As he turned the engine off, he rechecked the inside of his pocket and pulled out his automatic handgun to check the chamber. As he verified the bullets loaded, he could see the disappointing glare of his brother in the seat next to him. What? This again? I don't like guns, Jack. Yeah, me neither. I like getting shot a lot less. Subscribe and review today on Apple iTunes and like the Facebook page to keep up on all the latest episodes. I've been catching up on past episodes and you don't want to miss it.